Lance Armstrong, my man. What's up? What's going on? All right. Let's just dive in. I just got done working out. Nice, man. I kicked Tim Kennedy's ass. It was, I mean, I feel bad for the I guy. mean, who doesn't, right? I mean, Tim Kennedy's kind of a pussy. Just kidding, everybody. The opposite. Seriously, I owned him. <laughs> he just, I was doing a different workout, but he was, I could see him doing his, he was doing, <laughs> trying real hard and just kept looking over going, fuck. Fuck. He's owning me. <laughs> I mean, but if you got on a bike, though. You huh? If you got on a bike, though, you could take him. Well, yeah, but. Yeah. <laughs> and I keep looking at that, that uh, you know, that. 2K row up there. He's got his time up there. He's got the best time, at least uh -huh. on the board right now. I'm like, I bet I could do that. It kind of bothers you to see a time up there on the board. That, a time that, that, that's, that's ahead of yours. That right? I can. That's how I relate. <laughs> it's real that's, that's, that's real weird. Start the clock. You, you've just seen yours at the very top, yeah. with that lowest time so long. How close are you to that 2K row? No, I haven't right? done it. You haven't done it? No. Oh, you're just eyeballing We it. did the time You're just circling like a fucking the... Mako shark, just yeah. going around that time. I never, I've never done the rowing until we, the influencer... Uh -huh. Summit you had. Yeah. That was the first time I really rode. I mean, different power system, but kind of same idea, yeah. right? No, the crossover between cycling and rowing is actually very similar. Yeah. Believe it or not. Because I mean, those most guys of the do drive, most of the drive comes from the, the legs. legs and low yeah. back. And low back. Yeah. Yeah, I can imagine that. And then just the pure ability to push through pain. This is something that I wanted to talk to you about on mm -hmm. this podcast because with all my cycling experience there's it's just a lot of it is just your pain threshold it's like how much punishment are you willing to endure right. you know like there's there's always a little bit more that you yeah. could give but the trade is in just sheer physical agony but that's because you're not a cyclist it didn't it, what do you mean it had to have hurt no but it, but people that do you know the I'm not a runner but if I go run my it, the pain of, of me running is very different than the pain of Mo Farah running mm -hmm. or if I went in the gym like you go in the gym that you're used to that you're comfortable with that that's a right. that's that's been your neighborhood that you've walked around in for a long long time and cycling was my neighborhood or swimming was my neighborhood and <clears throat> if you haven't done that it's it's a it's a it's a rough neighborhood until you do it for a long long time and you get used to it and it just it's you can't compare so when you're on one of those hill climbs and everything I mean, there's just, there's the physical element of the body mm -hmm. having to burn that much fuel and the muscles getting right. that exhausted. I mean, there still has to be, even if you're a fighter, you know, fight, fought your whole life, there's that pain threshold right. of like how much more you can give. I played basketball my whole life. There's that hustling back on defense mm -hmm. when you're just exhausted after a couple fast breaks that there's these moments where you have to push through. You must have had, you know, an attitude or some kind of belief system or something inside you that allowed you to drive through more of that kind of pain. I'm right. not talking about like the joint pain and the discomfort right. and the awkwardness. Yeah. Yeah. You're talking about the pain where it's, where people get to a spot where they just, they want to stop. They want to stop. Yeah. I want to get off this bike or I want to yeah. get off this cord or I want to get out of this gym where you're just like, I can't, I don't want to do this anymore. I can't do this anymore. And, yeah. Um, you know, it's interesting. Like in, in, if you're trying to to train, at least the way we approached the tour and trying to win the tour, that training is it's it is truly a, an aerobic endurance event. There are times it's intense and times you have to go hard, but we didn't spend a lot of time training those systems. Mm -hmm. We spent times, most of the time, if not ninety five percent of the time, training that aerobic engine, mm -hmm. and so. And just try to follow along here. So at least this is the way we did it. I don't know what they do now, but the idea or the the the, the limiting factor in endurance sports is your lactate threshold. So that's the, if you go sprinting up a hill and you go sprinting as fast as you can, fast as you can, fast as you can. Ultimately, your legs start to slow, and then ultimately you stop. Yeah. That's because your legs and your body fills up with lactic acid. That's what stops you. And so. The threshold is something that you can test. You, mean you test it with a finger prick, and we would go out and test the threshold all the time through the blood. And you know, you're trying. You know what your the standard threshold is four four point zero millimoles. And so, our theory was always that by training just underneath that, right? Imagine if this is a, a ceiling. Mm -hmm. And for the listener, you have to. I guess right, there are viewers. This is the ceiling. You just want to keep knocking this up. Mm -hmm. And the theory we also had was that by training above it, you move it down. Yeah. And so we just, and, and that's underneath it going like this is not, 
they're long days, yeah. I mean, it's not a one hour maximum effort. It's a it's a seven hour medium effort. And would you use like heart rate monitoring to get there, or what would the? Because you weren't always pricking your finger, obviously, right? Like no. So once you establish, you know, you don't test it every day, and but you test it every couple weeks. So mm-hmm. and then you know where you are. Um, and there are vari- there are things variables that can change that, right? Altitude can change it. Heat can change it. Uh, fatigue can change it over fatigue over the course of days. So, um, you know, our, in our sport, it's what started out as a as, as training just started as how did you quote how did you feel? That's yeah. how it felt. Yeah. And then along came the heart rate monitor, which you could kind of see how you were feeling. Oh, my heart rate's one seventy. Okay, I'm, I know my max is two hundred. So you know where you are. And then there was yet another evolution right at the start of my career with the power meter. So the power meter came along, told you, <clears throat> not I'm told you everything, obviously speed, cadence, heart rate, but power. So power at the crank, and that ended up being really the gold standard for how we train. So forget because the heart. So that rate, was something you mounted on your bike. Well, it's it was it, it's built into the crank, right? And so the but the you know the monitor was at the like a, like a bike computer at mm-hmm. the bar. So that became the way that everybody trained, and even now to this day. It's the way everybody races. So you'll see these guys in the races, and all they're doing is looking at the wattage. And you know, the, a lot of people don't like that. They think it's too too robotic. Kind of like F1 racing versus NASCAR. Right? Well, yeah, they're just ripping although, around. Although although NASCAR has gotten pretty advanced, yeah, so, it's, you know, behind the scenes. But so that that was the evolution of that, and the, and there hasn't been another evolution of that since. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. And <clears throat> so you just. It's not like some of these events where you're training anaerobic threshold where you're really trying. Because I've watched Bodie Miller train, mm-hmm. and he would train because largely skiing is anaerobic. I mean, One it's minute. two minutes right. max two if minutes. you're yep. at Kitzbühel, yep. you know, and you're trying to hold however many Gs on every one of these turns. Yep. You know, it was he would put. 150 pounds on his back and sprint up a hill until he was like crawling and yeah, gasping. Yeah, I, I would just cry. <laughs> I, I, I mean, you'd never see me again. If if John Wolf had me do that, I would never come back. I swear to God, I'd be done. Yeah, and again, <laughs> right. but that goes to you know that goes. But that's to, a different neighborhood, right? And if and if he had to get, I'm sure if he had to get on a bike and and ride for four hours, he would never do that well, if again. You, said, you go ride to Waco. Yeah, <laughs> fuck that. Yeah, right. That's yeah. what. But it's that's that's my neighborhood, so it's right. just. It's just I I, th- I see what you're saying though. It's just what you're comfortable, what you train your body to adapt. Body's so unique that way because whatever input you apply will cr- it'll bend itself to adapt yep. to those goals. Yep. And you just started bending. At what point did you start bending your body towards those goals? Oh my god! Want? I mean, I was I was not as a kid, as a 10, 11 year old, twelve year old kid. I was. Grew up in Plano, or born in Dallas, raised in kind of the suburbs, mostly in Plano, and then just as we know, um, you know, kids just get put into the obvious or the the, the cool, you know, the the sports that that all the other kids are playing, and all the other parents want to see their kids play. So it's football, baseball, basketball. So I tried, and I, after, but, but even at twelve, I was like, you know, this is not. I'm I'm not very good at any of these, right? I'm not a side to side guy, and and. So I joined the swim team at 12, which was difficult at, even at 12 because it's a very technical sport, and most of those kids started at 6 or 7. So the swim stroke, I mean, you talk about putting you in an uncomfortable situation, say, and ride to Waco. It's pretty in, – in, most people can ride a bike, but if I said took you out to Lake Travis and said, okay, swim across, and you're not a swimmer, then you add in the technical factor, sure. the dynamics and the, and the technicality of the stroke. So I, I had to learn all this as, as quickly as I could – because as a 12-year-old, the most fucked up thing is they put me in the lane with a 6-year-old. So I was like, okay, I got to <laughs> figure this out. And so, But that really started my endurance journey, for lack of a better phrase. Uh-huh. That, was, that was the beginning of it. And, and then from there, tracking cross-country in high school and then cycling and triathlon. And Did on. you have a moment where you realized, like, fuck, I'm kind of good at this? Like, when was that aha moment? Yeah, I mean, I turned pro in triathlon when I was 15. Yeah, so, so it didn't take you long. It, Twelve it, to fifteen. Yeah, it didn't take long, and and it, and at fourteen, I was entering, I was forging birth certificates to get into because you had to be sixteen for the insurance and liability of the, the promoter to get. So I was forging these birth certificates to get in, um, and winning the overall 
these are local and regional events but it so I, at that point i'm like all right I, I think i got something here and then turned pro at 15 did my first pro race against the best in the world and got came off the bike second ended up getting fifth and uh i was like all right how did you train harder i mean is your was your body just naturally adapted to that like genetically epigenetically like how do you go from 12 to 15 and already being at the top of your local well the the by the so i mean i sort of joked although i wasn't kidding that i started swimming with the six-year-olds very quickly i started swimming fast yeah and so by the time i was 14 15 i was top five in the state for you know for long course freestyle or uh, uh, distance freestyle and so i had the obviously the triathlon starts with the swim so i had the advantage of getting out either ahead of everybody or with the leaders and you know when you, i was a competitor so if you're with the leaders I could fake it enough on the bike. I mean, the bike at, at the time, oddly, it was was one of my weaker things. And I could just stay in there and then, you know, suffer through the run. As a young kid, it's hard to get off with 30-year-old men that are going to run 32 minutes in the 10K. It's hard to get off and run with them. But I was just in it. I got it and it never even dawned on me to be like, you're not supposed to be here. <laughs> like, I, I was always, I looked around and I was like, well, fuck yeah, I'm supposed to be here. Like, it was if I raced any race, I don't care what sport it was in the endurance world, and there was a 15-year-old kid with that confidence and arrogance, and I mean, because I, I was a total punk, yeah, I'd be like, man. Well, actually, what I would do is probably sign him up to a lifetime contract. Because, <laughs> because, Recognize yeah, a little yeah, bit of self in that yeah, guy. Yeah, but it was. And how? So how much did the did competition itself play? in that in that mindset i mean did you just really like beating other people well yeah i mean right and that's but to me competition everything is a competition mm -hmm. right so obviously the the event is a competition that's where that's where your sponsors expect you to be that's where the prize money is that's where the tv is that's that's a competitive event but even training is competitive and, and when i say that i mean it, if you're training with if you're on a, a, a group run or a group ride that there's no tv there's no sponsors there's no prize money but that is competition and furthermore if you're alone so like when i, t I mentioned this idea of measuring watts and obviously you can measure time those also are competitions and you're all alone so you know we always had fast forward to the late 90s, early 2000s, I always tested on one climb in France called the Col de la Madone, just be, so between Monaco and the, and the Italian border in the little, outside of a little town called Menton. So it's about a 30-minute climb. And I would test there probably once every 10 days, all alone, with the stopwatch. And so that, to me, was as competitive as is if there were 20 guys there or 50 guys or right. when the TV was there and the prize money's there and the sponsors are there. Like, to me, that was, all, that was all the same. In fact, in many ways, even better. So in that, though, are you hypothesizing, like, what is your motivation for doing that? Is it just this internal drive to be the best you can be? Or are you imagining, as you're climbing that 30-minute mm. climb, are you imagining... I do this so I can beat them. Right. Like, what was what was your primary driver for that? Because that makes perfect sense. But right. like, still, I'm trying to get to the heart of this heart of this motivation. Let me tell you. <clears throat> and I was I just gave this talk in San Diego the other night, and this was a big part of it. But the 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 greatest motivator for me was the process. So a lot of athletes train, whether you're LeBron James or. Michael Jordan or Tiger Wood, whoever, they tr I, and I don't know their motivation, but you have to imagine that a lot of athletes train for that TV moment. Yeah. And that's, that's what they care about the most, which is great. That's probably what they should care about. I didn't care about the TV moment. In fact, that was more a thing that I just almost had to do. I was paid to do. The idea of, and the process isn't, a training ride or 20 training rides. The process is sitting down at the beginning of the season and saying, okay, number one, what's our goal? 
Number two, how are we going to go about it? Number three, how are we going to structure the season? And then it gets very, very specific after that, down to a weekly plan, down to a daily plan, down to an hourly plan. That's all the process. And so that's all I cared about. And that's all I loved. I loved the process. And so, and then, of course, with process, you get to test. I get to test it every week on the Col de But then, you know, the, the final test for us was the Tour de France. And so, but that was the part, it was almost a letdown. You know, it, it would, I loved the build. I loved, loved, loved the build. And then you'd go, I'd go win. And it would be like, I mean, my manager would always find me in the back of the, of the bus. I had this little room in the back of the bus and everybody's outside, like signing autographs and popping champagne. I'd be in there just quiet. Yeah. Because like, the process was over. It's over. He's like, man, what are you doing? Like, look, everybody's out here. I was like, I was like, I just wanted to get out of there. I just, it, it, and it just felt, it, I mean, I was safe in my room, but also, you know, and I just wasn't, that wasn't my thing, you know, to be. Yeah. That's interesting. I've told this story before on the, on the podcast, but uh, a pro poker player was speaking to his mentor who had won the World Series of poker. And he asked, man, when am I going to win the World Series of poker? And the mentor replied to him, well, when it's not a big deal if you win the World Series of Poker. Right. You know, when right. you've put so much into the process that that's just the logical conclusion of the efforts that you put in to lead up to that point. Right. Like, it's not going to you're not going to win the Tour de France and be like, holy shit, right. I won this thing. I, I, was, I, was surprised. I was surprised the first year. I wasn't surprised any time after that. Yeah. I knew I was going to win. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. So what does is, what is resistance look like? For you then because a lot of people can set that goal have the idea know what the process mm -hmm. is and still not be able to follow the process whatever forces of resistance that pull them away from that like what did that look like for you was it just absent or, or what form did it take what right. was the things that was trying to drive you off course um well there's the logical obvious one so illness injury you know, obviously in cycling, it's a you're on open roads, you have high speeds, you have yeah, you know, equipment failure. I'm talking about the internal stuff. Oh, internally, <laughs> no, I didn't even I didn't even know what you're talking about because there was none of that. I was just that's so wild. Yeah. That's fucking mind blowing. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> that's it. So like, that's the fucking difference. I never. <laughs> That no, but that but you, I don't think I don't know if you understand because you're you're this certain way. Most of us, you were talking about somebody getting a cold. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, hey, you get a cold. Well, most of us will have something that we want to do, and we'll know the process in order to do it. But our in, these internal forces will prevent us from doing. It. We won't show up. We'll make excuses. We'll find a way. Maybe we don't feel we're worthy. Maybe we don't feel like we deserve it. Maybe we get distracted. Maybe we just want to play small. Maybe whatever. All of these other parts of that what yep. steven pressfield calls capital r resistance that internal force that keeps us from elevating to our highest levels that starts acting on us and then we don't actually get to be our full potential yeah. but you didn't have that shit well okay then maybe we should back up because i, I think i did th i did think you were talking about a, a, you know a bike crash but <laughs> but you weren't so let's go back um because I was speaking about a specific period of time, a run mm -hmm. that I was on. So 99, 2005. None of what you just said existed. But the key, the key date uh, is not 99 to 05. The key date is 96. When, you know, I was at in, you know, 94, 93, 94, 95, 96 in cycling. I was... I was on this, <clears throat> you know, this trajectory. I was at the top of my game, uh, and then I'm diagnosed with testicular cancer, Ad very, very, very advanced testicular cancer. And now that you say it, I, and I look back to those years while, where I just said I was at the top of my game, I was good, mm -hmm. but I wasn't great. And and we should probably go back and and force me to think about those years, but post diagnosis post-treatment, post-period of just thinking, fuck, I may not live. Like, that's a very, it is a coin toss. Mm -hmm. I, was, I was at peace with that because I felt like I had done all the right things. My, that process there, that's where I really started to learn process. You know, I dug, and this is in 96, right? So it's not like you Googled 
you know, chemotherapy or yeah. surgery or cancer. I mean, you had to hustle to, to do the research, to start the process. And so I, I went on this journey of trying to find the best care and, and, and I got to a place where I thought I had found it. So I knew that if I lived, I could credit them. And that if I died, I couldn't, I couldn't blame anybody. You did your best. Because I, I, I exhausted all and, and it just wasn't going to work out, which is crazy to think about. I never got to a place where, other than obviously diagnosis, they're told how severe it is. I'm told how severe it is. That's when everybody freaks out, right? Oh, my God, I'm going to die. Then you start treatment, surgery, et cetera. It, the curve on it was, we got on it quick. Like I, it, I was like, I was encouraged by that. So I never, it wasn't like I got three months in, I was like, oh, I, don't, I don't think I'm going to live. Like, I just, my doctors used to always say, the better you do, the better you do. Meaning yeah. the quicker yeah. that they well, can, man, they can measure kill off. And that correlates to other cases they've had in the past, the better you do. And so, but that, that was really a year of my life that, that just rewired everything in me. And, and not all of it was good. Mm -hmm. And so when that got rewired, every day going forward from there, we were talking about training and process and you know what was the resistance? There was none. I had been in a place that was so desperate, um, unsure, um, unfamiliar, foreign, that, I mean, it sounds corny, you know, but it's like, it truly, like we had, you know, everybody, carpe diem, seize the day, all this blah, blah, blah. It's fucking true. Yeah. Like, I was like, I'm looking around going, wait, I get another shot at this thing? <laughs> like, it is, and so there was no, <laughs> I think it's so funny, I, was, I thought you were talking about bike crashes. <laughs> well, there was no sounds, resistance. It sounds like, you know, at the core of all resistance is fear. It's fear of letting people down. It's yep. fear of letting yourself down. It's fear of not living up to your potential. It's fear of yep. something. And the biggest source of fear, obviously, for a lot of people, comes from death. Because yep. death does all that. You don't get to live up to your potential. You, you're you going to hurt the people around you because they're going to be sad when you die. And you're going to be fucking dead. Like It's like it's the main source of fear. And for you to have to confront that. And to a certain degree, make peace with it. Right. You know, to a, of course, there'll always be the, some physical fear of dying if someone's coming to attack you with a knife. Like you're supposed to feel that fear, but like getting over that chronic systemic fear in such a big way mm. might have just sucked the fuel out of those forces of resistance because you'd already conquered capital F fear yep. in its most manifest form, the fear that you were going to die a slow, painful death from cancer. Yep. Like having to meet that fear transcending it well what else is yeah. there's what is else is going to stir up that much fear in you a good buddy of mine seth coppas lives on the big island I, I connected you with him when you were over there a while ago so his one of his main tenets in life is never take counsel from fear mm -hmm. and, and it i i know i don't but you know it, it this thing gets the tail on this is long like if we go back to October 2nd, 1996, you go into those, those seven years of winning the tour and, and was there resistance? It takes us to today when, you know, all the, of those things that I have done in, 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 in my entire life arguably aren't any harder or they're easier than the last five years of my life. And, and, and it's interesting to see people come up to me or come visit and they're like, and you know, they're trying to figure out you know, is the guy homeless? <laughs> is the guy curled up in a fetal position? Is the guy doing oxys all day long? Is the guy, wh what is the guy? And, the, and a lot of times they're like, wow, I can't, like, so this is your day? This is what you do all day? I'm like, fuck yeah, this is what I do all day. <laughs> this is what, and so I'm not bragging. I'm just telling you that all of these things in a weird way have trained me for total and complete meltdown. Yeah. Financial reputational, you know, communal, all of it. And that's, and that's become manifest to a certain point. When was, the, when was the peak of that? When was it like, when was it at its most dire? Where the lawsuit, the, the news, the everything, probably right before the Rogan podcast. That seemed like the fucking turning point, Rogan right? was, in you know, many ways, was, was a, that was an interesting uh, tipping point in a lot of ways. And I didn't know that Joe had such a following. Um, 
But I've never, you know, the main thing that people said about Rogan, and I did, it turns out a lot of people listen to his show, but uh, people that would, they'd stop me in the street and say, man, why didn't you just say that? <laughs> yeah. You know, but it's a fair question, but it's not an easy answer. Sure. Because if you, if I, and I don't remember exactly when I did Joe's show, but let's just say it's 2015 and I do Oprah in 2013. Me in 2013 is not me in 2015, and it's certainly not me in 2017. Mm -hmm. And so, and then the other big one I did was I did Howard Stern just, you know, six months ago. And, and obviously huge listenership, viewership, yeah. and people are like, man. So people point to Rogan and Stern. Yeah. Because everybody remembers Oprah. But that's, that's not, I couldn't have said those things then to those two guys or to you today, what I said back then. I wasn't, I didn't really understand what was about to go down mm -hmm. and what was not about to, what was going down and had been going down. Yeah. It's a uh, part of the, part of what another thing that I admire about you is, you know, what you're, what you have gone through and what you're currently going through. I mean, there's a fucking gigantic lawsuit mm -hmm. and for most people, if they had that much pressure, like I think about the things that stress me out and they're way less stressful mm -hmm. than the shit you have, but you don't- Nobody you don't... wants $100 million from you? <laughs> no, nobody's trying to take $100 million from me. No, wait a minute. Nobody's <laughs> trying to put your family on the street? <laughs> no, no, surprisingly. I mean, that's some fucked up not, shit. Not right think now. think about mean, that. I have I five know. kids. It's like- I haven't checked my phone. I mean, it could be something that happened in this podcast time, but as of right now. Yeah, but nonetheless, you don't- you come up, you show up here in the gym, it smiles, we're hanging out. Yep. It, it seems like, like you said, your whole life has prepared you for what would be the most crushing, yep. debilitating thing that a man could, could bear. Well, two things. Number one, I don't think that's going to happen. And, I, and I, I'm not a lawyer, but I know this case inside and out, and I know the law inside and out, and we're going to win the case. Mm -hmm. But if we lose the case... I'll figure it out. I always do. I'll figure it out. I, I mean, that's the fucking thing. Yeah. I'll that's the thing. Yeah. I'll, because I'll, you have to believe but that. But I'm not sitting here just, I mean, we could have an, it's, let's just say we lose, God forbid. And, and you could talk to me five minutes later. And it obviously that would just completely suck. But that's, I, in life and in my life, I just have made a commitment to myself and to my family and to my friends and to whoever's on the bus. We're moving forward, and we're gonna figure this shit out. And yeah, that that would that would totally suck, and there would be some adjustments. But we'll, buddy. Compare and contrast to, if my God forbid, I mean this is this is the worst thing to think. I mean your eight year old starts having weird symptoms, and 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 yeah. this has happens to people all over the world every minute of every day. And then, you know, your kid's diagnosed. Your kid has some life-threatening illness and does, I mean, the death of a child, I mean, they, there, there are so many things, not to be doom and gloom, but there are so many things way worse than that. And, you know, I, again, I go through my day with the confidence that the law, back to the thing, the law is on our side. Yeah. And, you know, there were a lot of other cases and a lot of other lawsuits that had to be sorted and, and managed, and those did suck. I mean, writing big fat checks back to people was like, wow. But, you know, and again, I, this came up in this talk the other day in San Diego. I was like, okay, so I had to sell the Gulf Stream. I had to sell the house in Hawaii. Mm -hmm. I flew out here for this speech on Southwest. But you know what? I, walk, I walked into that speech. I walked into the gym today. I walked into your office fucking head high, heart full. Yeah. Never been prouder. Yeah. And so... Like at it's the not time, that. like there were a lot of people like, okay, you got to sell your airplane. You got to sell houses. Oh my God. It's like we adjust. I adjust. My family adjusts. Nobody sits around and, and, and whines about not having the house in Hawaii. I mean, no. Yeah. We, we, we just. Well, you have, to, you have to have a couple things in place. First of all, you have to have the mindset that you're not going to live in the past and just spend every day of your life lamenting these past decisions that you made that you can't change anyways because we so many of us fucking do that you know we get caught living backwards in some scenario where we hypothesize we could have changed oh i wish i would have done this how come i was so stupid what if i would have done this so you got to move past that 
mentality. And then mm. once you move past that, then you also have to have the self-control of the mind to prevent yourself from having to play out every possible negative scenario that happens. Like for me, obsessing over, you know, what would be hard for me is both that, yes, living in the past is, all, is a challenge, but then also in the future, not imagining every possible thing that I would do if that $100 million lawsuit hit and like, all right, well, I'd sit on this spot. I would play a thousand scenarios that wouldn't actually prepare me hardly at all for the specifics of who I was then at the time I was then, but I still would have a hard time keeping my mind from just living in that future hell that may or may not happen and playing out a thousand games of possibility within yeah. that future. I but never, both of those. I, I never did that. <laughs> yeah, because yeah. that, that would change the quality of the life that you live right now. And that's those are traps that we all live. We'll project ourselves into the future, live out some future hell, diminishing our current present enjoyment of life, or we go back to the past, hypothesizing and pretending like we have any fucking power to change or control the past, rather than just being like, well, here I am now in the process of life. What can I do now in this process that's going to get me the most enjoyment, most experience, and then I'll deal with what comes in the future. Right. And you just I just wrote it down, too, because... Lament is not a word I use a lot, but if but we were talking about the past, and so you said lament, lamenting about the past, which I don't do, um, and I and I don't think I will ever do. But the one, the other, the, the L word that that I have used with the past is to learn. Yeah, and so there's a big difference between lamenting and learning, and I'm not trying to sound like some sort of Svengali here, but <laughs> but I don't lament, but I have definitely learned. And I'm still learning, by the way. And I will shit probably for a long, long time, I hope, be learning. Um, and so that's just, you know, August of 2012, when, you know, or that period, the fall of 2012, when it really came crashing down, that was that moment where, that was my diagnosis. That was another, that was a relapse, where it's yeah. like, okay, now you have to learn. And so I used you know, went on this journey, and again, still on it, of just learning, like, why am I here? Why, why am I in this place? What, what, you know, what happened? Diagnosing what the fuck happened. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, we all know the obvious one. <laughs> and by the way, that's the one that nobody cares about anymore. <laughs> like, oh, oh, he took, oh, really? Well, if you took 10 minutes on Google, you'd figure out that everybody did. <laughs> but that's not, if it was just that, we wouldn't be sitting here right now. Sure. And so that part of it I don't even think much about. It's in terms of learning. Mm -hmm. um, so it's just other aspects of my life, my personality, my history, my attitude, my relationships. So those, that's the stuff that, yeah. that I've had to, and enjoyed, quite frankly, learning. That's important because obviously, you know, there's a couple stances you could take with that stuff. A couple stances you could take where if your ego was unable to admit any fault, right, then you can't learn. If you think that you're always perfect and that you acted perfectly, then you can't learn. Right, right. But then no, if, that, but that's then never happened. Then, then <laughs> <That's> if you're <laughs> not in the last five years. But then if your judge, you know, is too harsh then you'll just keep in the past and you'll beat yourself up endlessly yeah. for that. So it's that, it's that right balance of having, you know, not too much ego and not too much self, self criticism to be able to go back, look at, all right, this is what I did. Could have done that a little better. I need to learn, mm -hmm. you know, I can learn from that. I can learn from this. I can learn from this. And then just once you get the learnings, just keep moving forward. Right. You know, and that's the thing that I think people have in the my hardest podcast. time. For everything in life, everything in my life is that's that really is the overarching theme at this point is forward, everything forward. Yeah, and 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 not to not to uh, uh, take on my critics or take on people from my past that that want to stay there. That th those are not those are neutral slash potentially reverse positions. Mm -hmm. That's not a forward position. So I I just didn't. Well, that was I was that's not in my DNA to get stuck, so I just kept moving forward and tried to you know move forward and learn and, and, and adapt and and allow myself to be completely humbled and almost hum, you know, and humiliated by this whole process and just you know learn to live with that and learn to deal with with 
shit you read or people's reaction or social you know what it's like this day, sure. these days i mean you, you if you want to put yourself out there you better be ready yeah how what do you have any particular strategy for that when you read some of the horrible nasty shit yeah. that's out there um you know is there um not i mean there's no strategy but it it the things that are said now and actually i should back i mean there's a lot less of that now but sure. let's, let's go back to you know from 2012 to 2014 it was there were books and documentaries and movies and i mean it was crazy mm -hmm. um and you know part of it you want to look at and go well that's not true and that's not true and that's not true and okay that is true but uh, <laughs> you know but th in all of that there's stuff that's just not true it doesn't matter yeah. you can't control that and so, but if you'd have put me back, if all of that would have happened to the to the man in 2005, I mean, it would have driven him crazy. I, I, my, my skin is so thick on that now that it doesn't, it doesn't affect me. I, I, I really can go zen on that. Yeah. And, you know, you then say, okay, well, what do I care about? I mean, 2005, I would have cared because I was making $20 million a year. I had, I mean, every major corporate company in America was my sponsor. So you, you cared. You, oh, my God, what if they hear? What if they find out? What if they, what if they call with questions? What if they drop me? What if, what if I don't, if I lose that money? That, I've lost all that. So I don't care. And so I get to be me. And, I, and, and what, so what do I care about? Well, I, care, I, I do care about me, but I care about my family. I care about their health and well-being and, and, and how they interact with their classmates and teammates the two things that generate fear are the ego which is based on your identity and the body and it seems like you've had to face the largest crisis possible for both of those things you faced the crisis of the body which was cancer which is one of the scariest body crises you can possibly face and then you faced the greatest fear of the ego which is a total crushing reversal of your identity your you know your public persona, who you are, your financial stability, your profession, all of that. And you've actually literally had to face both of those things. And you've realized, you come out the other side and you realize like, hey, here I am. Let me, let me, let me make this very clear for the listener. I'm, I'm just going to make this uh -huh. boil it straight down because you just, you hit it right on the head. So, and this happened overnight, not over the course of six months, a year, a month. Overnight, the headline started, let's just say on a Monday, the headline was the heroic Lance Armstrong. On Tuesday, the headline was the disgraced Lance Armstrong. Overnight. I mean, that was some shit. <laughs> I mean, it, that was it. Uh -huh. Overnight. Well, it's like a cancer diagnosis, right? Something feels a little funny. Yep. You know, now you got cancer. You had cancer the whole time, but yep. that comes in a fucking yep. comes in a moment. I mean, it was it was crazy. Yeah, that is, that is. <laughs> but something. that's how that's how quick. Two points quickly. How quickly it flipped, but also heroic. Heroic's a big word. Sure. And her, and they said heroic because of cancer and live strong and seven tours and I guess if you look at it, that kind of is heroic. But. To turn it all the way, they didn't go to average, they didn't go to maybe, they went to disgraced. Think about that word yeah, in front yeah. of your name. The disgraced Aubrey Marcus. I mean, nobody, nobody, nobody wants that name in front of their, right. or that word in front of their name. I mean. I mean, I guess you could say at least you were graced. In order to be disgraced, you know, <laughs> at, least you had, at least you had to get somewhere first. Yeah. But no, 100%. I mean, yeah. this is, these are the greatest fears that you have to face. And I think... In my life, I've realized the more that I can lean into these fears, mm. you know, the better a man I become. The the less, the more that I can kind of conquer capital F fear at large, the less that influence of fear limits my free will, limits my ability to choose, limits my ration. You know, like fear is the thing that'll it'll make you emotional, it'll make you quiet, it'll make you play small. It'll it is the source of this resistance. And so, the more you lean into it and beat it on whatever little level that it comes the better off you'll be. And I think that's why I've driven my life into, you know, doing things like plant medicine. Like the first time I did ayahuasca, 
it took me through all of the fears that I had that I had. So the first one was I had visions of these bugs. I, didn't, I don't really like bugs, but there was bugs crawling in my ears and in my eyes and in my nose and down my throat, and they were laying eggs, and they were exploding out of all my head, and they were, they were making <laughs> like worms in my stomach, and they were crawling all around, and I was like, oh, this is uncomfortable, but I think I'm okay with this. Like I wasn't that scared of it. And then it had me sliding down this vine of thorns naked and the thorns were like ripping up my balls and my dick and everything was just getting shredded and i was getting you know completely eviscerated by this vine of thorns and i was like that was really unnecessary especially to be naked and to see my balls turn into fucking cheese grater you know on this oh. vine of thorns like that was and unpleasant. you remember all that shit oh yeah i remember it vividly clearly right so i'm sliding down there that's some, that's some <laughs> up and then and then so and you know it. You know you're kind of in medicine, and it's not. You don't feel it, so it's not completely real, but it right. feels real enough. And then, you like but what check, really make sure you're, yeah, your yeah, for sure. You give a little. You just give a little you, grab. You, yeah, <laughs> you give a little grab. <laughs> uh, but the one that got me was ayahuasca. Was then like when, when I was okay with that, and it didn't really get to the core of the fear. It was like, oh, and by the way, you have cancer. Mm. Like that was the ayahuasca gave me that diagnosis and ceremony. And, you know, I'd had family members who'd had it and it was something, you know, a latent fear in my mind. So it told me that. And that was the diagnosis. It wasn't a doctor, but it was, you know, Dr. Ayahuasca who told me that I had cancer. And I had to wrestle with that for two hours. And I fought it and said, no, it's not. I'm just hallucinating. This is bullshit. I don't actually have it. And it's like, no, you do. You really do. This is medicine just actually tapping into your body's wisdom and letting you know that you actually have it. So you really do have it. And this is just the time that you found out. And I was like, oh, my God, I can't believe it. Until finally, somebody's actually saying that it's all in my head, all in my head. The shaman's not. No, the shaman doesn't even speak English. He's just with his ikaros. So just in your head. You're just going, in my head. Wow. Ayahuasca is talking to me and telling me that, and so it it finally convinces me that all right, you have cancer. And I said, finally, after two hours of rolling around and vomiting and like, oh no, please, like fighting it, I just surrendered and said, all right, I have cancer. Mm -hmm. I'll fight it if I can. I'll live the rest of my life as beautifully as I can, so be it. Mm. And the moment that I let go and said, so be it, the fear lost all of its power. Yeah. And it felt like that scene from Avatar where all of these tiny spindles of, of light and fibers like held me into the ground and like just drew me back into the core of earth where I was connected to all things, where eventually you know, my body would go. And it was this most peaceful, one of the most peaceful moments of my life. Mm. So for me, in, I've used that lesson to be like, okay, that got me a lot over my fear, you know, because I didn't have to actually feel it in the, in, the, in the actual physical world. I got to feel it in my own psyche, right. in my own mental world, and reap some of the benefits. Now, obviously, you can kind of slough that off as like I was just an eye, but it, but it counts. It counted in my ability to overcome that fear. And so I think that's one of the things that's kept kept drawing me into these plant medicine ceremonies and drawing me into other things like open relationship, you know, areas where I find things that I'm terrified of. Oh yeah. Someone sleeping with the girl that I love. That's fucking terrifying. Well, maybe you should experience I didn't know we were on, get on the other, on the other side of that, right? Like, <laughs> I didn't like, know we were getting into all this. So this like, you need to save this for my podcast. <laughs> sure. This man. is your podcast. <laughs> sure. But <laughs> we're going to repeat I just, this. Shit. I just, I, absolutely. <laughs> I think it's just, it's interesting that you've actually had to experience it in the manifest mm. and that's no it's been a five-year ayahuasca trip. yeah it has been it has been 100 I mean, the way you just described all of those things and i've never done ayahuasca although i'm not opposed to that but i'm a little terrified of that but it, it, the way you just described it is is the way that it has felt yeah and and another big fear that we all have and i speak to this all the time is do we have friends Mm. right do we have it's a big one it's a huge one and who is who is our friends and it's not you know oh you're my best friend oh this is my friend no i mean friends and friendship and so that's been the gnarliest experience of all of this because you know when it's when the lights are bright and the champagne's cold and you're in a <laughs> swanky city like paris let me tell you something brother you got a lot of fucking friends. Oh yeah. The day after Oprah, Oprah, Oprah Winfrey, in you know January of 2013, that's the polar opposite, right? So that's heroic to disgraced. 
And so you quickly figure out who your true friends are. You quickly yeah. figure out what true friendship is, what love is, and what partners are, and what community is. And so that that is as dark as all that sounds, it's been the most beautiful thing. It's I been bet. the thing that uh, on both sides, it's it's been good to know or to learn who really wasn't a friend. And I don't I don't say that from a dark place because, you know, it's it's always nice to cull things in your life. But this the flip side is learning who true friends are. People that you didn't even they weren't interested in bright lights and cold champagne and swanky cities. They 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 just wanted to hang when they could. And yeah. So then they're both surprises. But but the but the upside surprise is way, way, way better than the downside surprise. I think particularly when you're in a position of power, power creates a distortion field. Because if you have power, then it tickles the other people's desire to For sure. get a piece of that power, right? So you create this power distortion field. Like if you got nothing, you kind of probably are pretty confident that your friends are your friends. Right. You know what I mean? But as soon as you have power and wealth and opportunity and the ability to be something greater by being your friend, and I think everybody has that moment, some latent fear that mm. are these really my friends or are they not my friends because they're benefiting in a significant way from this friendship. And I think I see that with so many powerful, powerful people. Where well, all, you see it. Yeah, I do. <laughs> Stop. I do. Look around. I do. You, you, I mean, I do. Look, at the, look at the trajectory of your story, sure. the trajectory of this business. If you don't see it, you better see it. Yeah. No, 100%. And the interesting, you, you said power, you know, and you talked about what is perceived power, right? I think you said perceived power because it really is perceived power. Mm -hmm. Because with celebrity and with success and sport, with whatever it's sports, business, entertainment, politics, that's perceived power. Which <clears throat> I guess the moral of the story is after the five year ayahuasca trip, I feel more powerful now than I've ever felt my entire life because I know these things. Personal know, power. Personal power. So yeah. that's very different than, yeah, yeah. than perceived power. And it's just, it's such a better place. And so it's like as fucked up as all this has been and as loud as I could scream for years, like this is wrong and I'm getting screwed and oh my God. I wouldn't change a thing because mm -hmm. I get to sit here today just, just the way I sit. And I'm going to leave here and I'm going to drive in my car to my <laughs> office as me. And, and it's just, it's, I mean, it's a, it's a, like, it's an amazing spot that, that I never knew that, well, no, that did not exist for me in my life. You're, you must feel freer now than you ever have. Are you happier now than you've ever been? For sure. For sure. I mean, I don't have any, I don't work for anybody, Yeah. which is nice. Um, just on a, you know, obviously my kids are happy and healthy and doing great in school and I have a great partner and, um, yeah, it's, um, uh, you know, it's, 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 it just, I keep going back to this, but I just, I feel like, and again, it's evolving and changing and, and there are other X factors out there, but I feel like I wake up in a real position of power and not mm -hmm. that I'm going to go, you know, create a hundred million dollar business or I'm going to create, you know, some other thing that they write about. It's just, it's just a walk through life. Yeah. And it's, I could be walking to the gym or I could be walking through an airport or it's just like, I'm ready. Yeah. That's the, <laughs> it's that, that's, I think, everything that we're striving for, but we get confused. I mean, I think if someone said, what was the peak of Lance Armstrong's happiness, who didn't really understand psychology and understand you, they'd say, oh, fuck, you know, right in the middle of that run. You know, it's got to no, be would, the happiest, would, that's they, the happiest he'll ever be. They would say, after winning his seventh tour, engaged to one of the most famous rock, famous and beautiful rock stars on the planet, that's it. Couldn't get any better. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I mean, you. It's, and here you are, fuck. and this is the happiest you've ever been. Yeah, it's not even. And I and and it was fun. Sure. Then, right? Fun is fun is fun. Um, but I wouldn't I wouldn't trade that. I wouldn't trade this place for that or any other place for anything, anything. And who knows what's around the corner? Right. 
And it, again, this is a lesson to just focus on the process of life. Yeah. Like no matter, no matter if, if this is your peak or whatever you've gone through, like the whole process cumulatively is leading towards if you keep doing the work and if you keep improving, keep learning, you know, it's just going to get better. Whether the, whether the pinnacle of your career, the peaks, the valleys, the yeah. things that happen, like just enjoy the whole thing. It's clearly not about the destination. The whole thing is the destination. The process itself is the destination, yep. you know, and then, so just focus on the fucking process. Cause here, this is the perfect testament of all the highs, all the lows, everything. And here you are now, even with this hundred million dollar lawsuit over your head, the happiest Lance Armstrong you've ever been. Yep. That's right. Man. <sighs> <laughs> that's, that's a lot of that's a lot of wisdom did i mention that in. i kicked tim kennedy's ass in the gym today <laughs> i mentioned yeah. that didn't i yeah like physically right like like you just slapped him a few times and yeah he, he's a he's a special individual yeah. that guy so much that's one of the beautiful things i love about so conservative like all these, <laughs> did you see these tweets no i haven't it, seen it them. kind of makes you want to whoop his ass in the gym. i mean it's like how can you you can't think that nobody can think that way you cannot think that you way. should you need to have him on your podcast you guys need to go I, back. Could, I couldn't listen to what, whatever he tweets, and uh, I couldn't listen. Okay, podcast over. We're done. We have, we're done. No, you'd have to stick through it. You have to fucking no. just. I, he, he, yeah, yeah. That's, that's I do love getting all these different perspectives on there because then you start to be able to piece together because we're all just trying to figure it out, you know. And I think too many times what's projected is not accurate, you know. Like, so it's not helpful, you know. Like. LeBron James is not a helpful person to get inspired by right. in general. Because it's just like in high school, he looked like the strongest grown-ass man you've ever seen in your life. Like where was his struggle? Where was his challenge? Where was the stuff that you can really learn? It looked the only like one. He only had one struggle. Yeah. And and when, so and what was that? When he well, when he left, you, you think back when he when he left he Cleveland, was leave to, Cleveland, left and he Cleveland made, and he made a big to do about it, the decision or whatever they yeah, called yeah, it, yeah. and he did the sit down with Jim Gray. I mean, he was most would say he was for that month or however long it was, he was the most hated man in sports. Like it was viewed very critically. But and, he never really opened up to how that felt, right? No. Like, like he hasn't had this moment where he goes and being like, "Man, that was fucking hard." Yeah. Like these were the hard times. These were the the negative thoughts that I had during that period. Cause that is actually inspirational. Like yep. that actually means something like, yes, from the outside we can imagine, but he just kind of like, it seemed like he just kind of like, yeah, you know, whatever it's business. But by the way, watch, it's going to happen again. He's going to leave again. Yeah. He's going to go play for the Lakers <laughs> and they're going to be fine with it. Like it's yeah. going to be a totally different, they're going to be like, I understand. Yeah. You want to go with it's nice weather and you have a house there and you've won us a couple championships and your kids are happier there. Go ahead. <laughs> like it's going to be completely yeah. different. It's true. It's true. Well, it was fucking awesome to be able to sit down and hear that, hear that, those words of wisdom from you, man. It's Thanks, been brother. fun. Fucking been fun hanging out hanging at here. Honor. Yeah, absolutely. It's been good for me. Yeah. Yeah. The whole crew. No <laughs> doubt, the whole crew's solid. More adventures to come, my friend. Absolutely. More adventures to come, and Thanks I'll so. I'll jump on your podcast here sometime soon. Let's too. do it. We, we'll we'll go deep. I'm glad we'll I stopped weird. you from all yeah, of we'll, this open relationships. <laughs> we'll, we, go, we'll go deep. We'll get weird. So. You've already told me some stuff where I've, I've put it in my in my hard drive. Like, okay, okay, we're gonna talk okay. about this shit. All right, let's bring that up. <laughs> Thanks, brother. Yeah, brother, for sure.